I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, which is a beautiful place, but five days after I graduated from high school, I packed a car up with all my stuff and drove to San Francisco. Worked for a while and started going to school, and that's why I decided to become an artist. Two of my brothers were artists, and I could see that they were the only people I knew in society that were allowed to do whatever they wanted to do. But at the same time, I had met this woman trying to do something as an artist with stained glass. And as an excuse to get to know her, I asked her to show me how to work with glass. She'd shown me how to cut glass and solder. And then she kicked me out of her studio and she gave me the best advice possible. She said, go home and do whatever you want to do. So I started working in glass with no real training or idea. And I made a lot of weird, wonderful stuff and got my first show at the gallery in San Francisco. By sheer chance, Cecile McCann of Art Week took a liking to me and gave me two full pages with seven photographs. And my career was launched. I mean, it just overnight, because Art Week was read all over the United States. I got into glass as a youngster. My father, Paul Marioni, started working with glass in about 1970. He would bring home these lumpy little forms that he made, and I was so uh, intrigued. I hadn't seen anything handmade. I hadn't seen something that was goopy and amorphous. I knew I was going to have to try it. And uh, when we moved here in 1979 to Seattle, when I was 15 years old, I did have the opportunity to start blowing glass. But I was pretty determined I wasn't going to follow in his footsteps, um, or anybody's hippie glass footsteps for that matter. It just didn't look like a very uh, easy way to make a living. And I was right, it really isn't. When I was still in high school, I met Benjamin Moore. I worked with him right when I got out of high school as an assistant on a glass blowing team. And I just really liked his approach. He had a design specific approach to glass making that nobody else did at that time. He could blow glass on center at will. From there, I continued to work with Benny throughout the 80s and 90s, and I still do. Everybody, of course, expected me to be a glass artist. And it really held no fascination to me. It's hot, it's difficult, it's boring. And I was also pretty rebellious, you know, as much as I could rebel against the most lenient parent ever who, you know, basically we, there was very little that we couldn't do. So people would say, you know, oh, so you're a glassblower too? And I would say no, and usually with profanity included. I can't get away from it, it's there, you know, and I work with my father so much and I know how to do it. It never held any, any draw to me whatsoever. I'm doing embroidery on cotton and I embroider tiny little pictures that I then embed either in resin or behind a watch crystal. I'll set them the way you would set a stone in a bezel. I make all of my own rings and structures that I embed in. Right now I'm working on a couple of bracelets using these little pictogram images. My father one day came to me and said, you know, you hate working for people. It's time you just embraced being an artist. And because I had never wanted to be an artist before like him and work for myself and because I saw him struggle so much. Jewelry I just started to do because at the time I was bartending and I was thinking about this ring that I had seen one time and I really wanted it but I knew that I couldn't find it anywhere so I went and bought just the basics of what I needed and started with just a little you know handheld torch and taught myself how to make jewelry. Since then I've worked for myself and you know I've been able to make a living. I've been very fortunate. I maintain a studio here in this building, as does my dad, and my dad actually resides here as well. And my sister Marina has a studio space within dad's studio. So yeah, we see each other pretty much every day now. 
Where did you see that? Bob? Got a, a you know an ad for it in the mail today. So I looked to see who was going to be there, and, and saw your name. Seriously? Mm-hmm. What did it say? My parents were hippies. Cut, cut me some cut slack. Cut me some slack. My parents were hippies. <laughs> Maria's got a button. Mom sent me that. You know, mom and dad got divorced when we were little, and uh, after that, it was I don't know. That's kind of a strange thing to talk about because you know I had a rather alternative upbringing. I guess you could say. Dante and I grew up in Marin County early to mid 70s and it was a pretty free and easy time. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, I think our family motto was mistakes were made. <laughs> and there was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of hippies and free love. And when my mom left, I was four and Dante was six. I remember when my father said to us, help me through this because, you know, he was in his 20s and had two little kids and no help. And he was just starting his career as an artist, which is difficult under any circumstances. But Dante was a lot more disciplinarian. You know, Dante was the one who would say, you're not, you're not doing that. And, you know, I'd say, you're not my father. He'd say, I don't care, you're not doing that. I worked for maybe 14, 15 years with Dale Chihuly putting the program together at Pilchuck, what I called the flat glass program. When I first went to Pilchuck, I'd been hearing about it for years from Dad. I could tell from how enthusiastic he was about it, exactly what was going on up there. And uh, sure enough, the first time I went up there, I went on my motorcycle, I was 15, I think. And uh, as I came riding up the driveway, there was the pond, it was on a hot summer day, and there was everybody naked at the pond, hanging out, including my dad. And uh, he was right, it was an amazing place. The uh, vibe there was pretty exciting. And then Lino, Talia Pietra came to Pilchuck. Dante was there, and, and then Lino mentored Dante. So he got the best teachers. I am cognizant of how generous Lino Talia Pietra was to me. He's shown me everything, and. Dick Marcos. I mean, there's no secrets, you know. The only way you learn how to do things like this is by observing them. This one rocks pretty good, probably about 10 minutes. Basically, it's kinetic energy. I've found through experiments, the sharper the curve, the slower it rocks. I tend to like to make faces. So this is the pattern. I use a pink foam. That's the pattern for the finished piece here. So you can see I was able to slump this to this three-dimensional curve. Let me show the whistling vase. This one uh, wiggles its butt. <laughs> I thought to myself, how far can I reduce the human form and still make it immediately recognizable? Well, the lips will do it, <laughs> and the back. <laughs> the difference between my brother and my father as I see it is that for my father, he loves glass because, as he says, it captures light. But to him, it doesn't have to be blown glass. It can be, you know, whatever, kiln cast or sand cast or whatever way to best convey the message he's trying to convey. Because his work is all about content and my brother's work is all about design. My brother believes his craft is conveyed in glass. He's using his influence of Italian glass, shape and form and all of that and color. Just that process of stretching it out down the hallway, it looks so simple. And it, and it really is, but still there's just a whole bunch of different ways you can mess it up and have it pull too skinny or really skinny on one end and really fat on the other. You know, you just, it's like anything, you just have to really pay attention. And I'm just laying these out so that they all interlock and then we'll pick them up onto the pipe and I'll just make a simple cylindrical shape and uh, make a piece out of it. Picking this up onto a blowpipe isn't really as difficult as it looks. You need to have 
somebody who knows what they're doing helping you out. I could not do it by myself. You just have to be really conscientious of the temperature that it's at. If you do it too hot, it's gonna wanna flop right over onto itself. If you do it too cold, you're in danger of it breaking before you can get it back into the fire. It can be a disaster, and that's happened before. People ask me all the time if I taught them how to blow glass. I, I laugh because of course not. As a teenager, he had the attention span of a gnat, and I had an equivalent amount of patience. I've been watching him blow glass since he was 17. 30 years I've been watching him. I still come down every day, and I can't believe it. You know, he's just so good. His eye-hand coordination is phenomenal. It's, his skill level is, I mean, I'm still amazed. I watch him and go, how can he do that and work on that scale? So everything's got to be perfect with Dante. And he gets it perfect. I mean, of course, he has tens of thousands of hours experience.